Hello and welcome to the workshop. Today I want to talk about um, some of the nifty features that were incorporated into muzzle loaders for target shooting. Now, in, in particular here the example is a uh, flintlock pistol. Now this is a reproduction uh, Italian Bondini from the early 80s but it has a lot of the features which were incorporated into uh, period target pistols and I thought it'd be interesting to see the, t the tricks that they used um, because Basically, all the things that we require still today for our target shooting firearms, pistols. Um, we want an exceptional trigger, we want a fast lock time, we want good sights and good ergonomics. Well, these requirements have existed ever since firearms have been used for uh, target shooting. So well, it would be interesting to those, particularly those who are not so familiar with muzzle loaders, to see how they solve these mechanical issues. Um, so as I said, this one is a replica, but here you can see an original pistol. Uh, this is from the uh, 1820s, built by Lepage in Paris. And you can see on there pretty much everything that uh, we're going to talk about. We have a roller frizzen, we have a vent liner, a single set trigger, we have some adjustable sights, and one thing we can't see, but which I highly suspect it has, is a fly on the tumbler. So what I propose is uh, we take uh, those features and uh, we'll see what they look like in uh, on this pistol and you know, what, what uh, advantages they bring. So let's start with the most visible which is uh, the uh, the sights. Now this one is actually not adjustable um, but as you saw in the period pick it was quite common to have a dust tailed front sight, which is what I plan to do on this once uh, I've got some practice on the milling machine, which in, whenever it arrives, is, the, yeah, I've got more than enough metal here could to uh, mill a little dovetail slot and then make up some uh, front sights of different heights. And uh, that means I don't need to change out the back sight here, although I might change that to a U rather than the V-notch. Um, what I have seen on some uh, high-end percussion replicas is uh, a little elevation adjustable blade with a little grub screw and there's a little uh, screw mechanism inside underneath the breech tang here. Um, however I haven't been able to see that kind of thing on, uh, on a, an original so I, don't, I suspect that that was a, uh, a modern adaptation for target shooting. Um, if you know of an original, a nice picture of an original then uh, please comment below to have a look. Uh, the standard seems to have been just dovetailing, either the front or the back. So the next feature is uh, this plug here. This is a vent liner. Um, I shall explain what this is for through the medium of this lovely diagram. So here we have cross section of the barrel wall, powder charge, and this is the ignition charge in the pan. So um, if this plug was not there, we would just have a straight hole going through the side of the barrel and we need to get the heat from the ignition all the way to the powder charge. So it's going to take a little bit of time. You get the fizz bang if, it, if your lock is well timed. Um, what this liner allows you to do is to put a conical surface on the inside which brings the main charge closer to the ignition charge so you get faster ignition. Uh, also um, Every time you're firing, you get basically a little blowtorch effect, gas cutting through this tiny little pinprick hole here, which is going to erode over time. We had basically, they, they of course had iron barrels, gradually transitioned to steel, but still uh, the effect remains the same. And with a liner, it allows you to use different materials. Uh, some of them remained iron. Uh, but then you could then, of course, line it with something else, like uh, typically it would be gold and later platinum. Um, these also, of course, are not so sensitive to corrosion. So uh, those would uh, last a little bit longer. However, these things are sacrificial. They would wear out eventually um, and you would have to bore it out or with a reverse thread tool, take it out and replace it with a new one. Typically what, the, what you find today, uh, these plugs come with an extra bit here, which will have some kind of a screw slot or a hex key slot, 
uh, you put it, you screw it into place, and then you file off so that uh, you just get a flush face with the little hole in there. Sometimes they have a little countersink. So this one has uh, seen some use, as you can see, but uh, it should still work perfectly fine. I don't think it's a uh, it needs to be replaced just yet. Um, I haven't fired this because there's a complete lack of a round ball in the right caliber in Switzerland at the moment. So uh, I shall have to either <clears throat> find some uh, lead balls elsewhere or break down and get yet another casting mold. So now we'll see the tips and tricks to increase lock time, literally. Probably where the expression comes from. So the first one is this roller prison. Self-explanatory really, you've got a little bearing, just a roller in this case. Um, it could also be present on the frizzle instead. Um, and this reduces the contact surface between the toe of the frizzle, which you can see up there, and the frizzle spring. Our frizzle spring is there to maintain the frizzle in the closed position and it also in the open position. So you can uh, charge the pan and resist the strike of the flint. But you need it to flip nice and smartly so the sparks fall down into the charge. And having this reduced contact area really does make things smoother. Um, here you compare it to a uh, more military lock here. This is from my Repro Baker rifle. Here we've got the toe of the frizzle, which is just sliding, almost scraping along the top surface of the spring here and it's a far uh, it's far more resistance when it pivots even when you get to the tilting point. Uh, you can put as much grease and oil as you like it's not it's just going to push through squeeze it all out anyway. The only thing you can do is polish the interface there to try and improve things but obviously a, a nice fancy little bearing surface would be useless in uh, the battlefield environment. So next feature is the fly and I hope you can see all this because it is going to get tiny. So it's this little tiny lever you can see here on the inside of the tumbler. But before I explain why it's there and why it helps, just a quick flintlock 101. So we got the mainspring, powers the tumbler with this piece here, pushes down on this uh, toe and when you pull the trigger it propels the hammer down in the cock. Now you've got a half cock notch here which is quite deep and when the sear engages that it means that pulling the trigger won't move the sear and it won't fire. This is a, a primitive safety. These are not 100% safe but it's better than nothing. And then the full cock notch is usually quite small and there's no lip on it so that when you, uh, you see this one, it's, you can just see it. And when you pull the trigger, the uh, sear can move down, straight down, slip past and the cock will fly forward. like so. But there is, the, the half cock does present some potential problems. Now we, here we're talking about you know fractions of a second but this is a target firearm and this is what we're trying to shave off. And there's enough things going on in the flint lock that any you know every little helps. So uh, the problem is with the half cock notch. So if your lock isn't finely tuned and your spring's not balanced, what could happen is that when you pull the trigger, it just falls to half cock instead. So you've lined up your shot, you're fully concentrated, and it just click. Um, the other problem is that you've got a little bit of the ever-present friction. So even if it does tumble properly, it might also bounce off a bit the, uh, of the half cock notch. And this is causing some delay. So this is why the fly is present. I can see it here, a little shiny bit. There's the, the end of the lever. So when 
you put it to heart, so assuming it's in five positions, C is like this. When you cock the action, notice what's happening to the fly at the back. It gets pushed out of the way and you can engage the half cock safety as normal. When you cock the hammer fully, the fly is now sitting in front of the sear. And when you pull the trigger, the fly gets pushed, oops, gets pushed by the sear and it comes up against the half cock notch and pushes the sear away. So there's no chance of it hooking up on the half cock and um, you've got far less friction from the sear pushing up against the tumbler. So the only place I've seen this on a military rifle was the experimental uh, 1848 Swiss Stutzer, which we have a video on from ages ago, where they, they trialed this out um, and when uh, they uh, modified it to become the 1851 Federal Carbine, they got rid of it because, again, it's uh, nice to have, actually useless on a military firearm. And the final mechanism to look at is the set trigger. Now this is sometimes called a French style set trigger as opposed to a German style. The main difference being that the so-called French system uses a single trigger both to set and fire, whereas the German system typically has two separate triggers, one to set, prime the unit, and the other one to fire. Uh, of course this single mechanism is a bit smaller, a bit more compact, and best suited to uh, pistols. Now I've coloured some bits in to try and explain things a little bit more clearly. Uh, things to keep in mind, the big red spring here, which is pushing down on this red part, and we have a slightly lighter spring in black here, which is pushing upwards on this black part here. But I realise that you still can't see a thing. That's better. Long live Perspex. So, um, force arrows here represent the springs, so the uh, red part here is under far more spring pressure than the black bit here. So we'll call the black part the secondary sear, so it's got nothing to do with the lock sear, it's only within the set trigger mechanism. And this red bit, which is pivoting actually inside the trigger unit, uh, we'll call that the striker. And um, so what happens when you, put, when the system is under tension, is uh, say you, you pull the trigger normally, it does this, does its job, and it comes back to rest. When you pull the trigger forward, you get a situation like this under pressure. So the striker here, red, gets caught by the secondary sear and when you start pulling the trigger back this lower part of the trigger pushes up on the secondary sear onto a point where it releases the red striker so there's a little bit of delay and you saw that the red bit catches up with the rest of the trigger housing so of course it's under a lot of force from the spring so it smacks up and accelerates the upwards movement and therefore you get the set trigger effect. Now the little spring, little screw here underneath, all that does is it controls the separation between the trigger section here and the, the, uh, the end of the secondary sear and that means you control how much overlap there is between the striker bar and the upper part of the sear and therefore how much travel you get on the set trigger before the striker bar is released. I hope that was clear. So everything is now reassembled and uh, cleaned. Things I do for you guys. No, love you really. So normal trigger pull is like so. Now we'll set the trigger and it's set quite light. So you get a nice click, positive click when you push the trigger forward. That's the uh, striker bar here engaging with the secondary sear. So when we start to pull the trigger back, watch the top of the trigger unit. See it's lifting up ever so slightly there. A little bit of freedom. And then all of a sudden, tuck, 
striker bar is released and smacks the whole unit up and everything pivots up and the shot fires. And here she is all put back together again. Can't wait to get her out to the range once I've got uh, the ammo for her. Um, so I hope you like this little overview of a tricked out muzzle loader. Um, of course, what I've shown here will have existed on the prior systems as well. So basically, as soon as there was a sprung lock, uh, snapping match locks, wheel locks, um, the Michele, the earlier type of flint locks, and of course the percussion era, all these features existed in one form or another, adapted to the particular mechanism. Uh, so uh, next time the uh, target shooter boys are out on the range boasting about their set triggers and all that, know that the uh, sooty muzzle loaders have been at it for centuries. So uh, all that leaves me to do is uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, of course, uh, for your support on whatever platform you wish to join us on. And I will see you nicely on the range next time.